We'd like to start the meeting. We are here tonight for the, uh, to discuss JC Quarry Park master planning. Uh, my name is Joseph Curlin. I'm the superintendent of parks and forestry for the city of Sheboygan. Um, I'm very excited to be here tonight. It's, uh, it's a rare occasion when we, do, when we are able to do a new master plan for a city park. Uh, so it's an exciting process. Um, I would like to uh, welcome everyone that's here tonight uh, that's, um, that, that came to the meeting um, and then also signs of the times. Uh, we have this going out virtually um, in, in many forms. So uh, welcome the people that are watching us uh, virtually also. Um, the people here, i uh, like to remind you that um, we are gonna practice social distancing. Uh, so please, um, even at the end of the, end of the meeting, when we talk with the consultants, um, please maintain that six foot distancing. Appreciate that. Um, there will be time for questions for people that are at the meeting. Um, for the people that are not here, and I'm gonna encourage everybody watching this, over the next couple weeks, to please go to Sheboygan DPW, that's our website, and go to contacts, and then just simple, it's simple, you fill out um, a form, um, ask us a question, tell us that you were, uh, that you've seen us, um, let us know what, you, you, what questions you have about a new design at JC Park, and we will get back to you. So please do that, um, um, everybody that's watching this. I would appreciate that. Um, so this is actually the second community meeting that we're holding. Uh, we did meet with um, uh, people at, actually at the park um, users of the, the disc golf course, users of the bike path, uh, mountain biking, and users of the Quarry Beach Adventure Park. Uh, we sent out uh, invitations to uh, those three groups and they sent them out to people that they know that really use the area and we, we were able to get their feedback. So that happened on August 27th. This is our second community meeting and then there will be one more final community meeting and that will be with, be with the Marina Parks and Forestry Committee sometime in November. That has not been decided yet. But um, today with us, I'm gonna be shortly turning this over to the consultants that the city picked. Um, at the beginning of the year, we sent out requests for proposals to several consulting firms that we know and um, it was given to Grafe Auto Madison. We have with us tonight, Joe Porter, Ed Freer, and Alex Thill. So they will be walking us through this process in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna first answer a question. What is a master plan? A master plan allows the city to assess current and future recreational needs, evaluate feasible options, develop a strategic action plan, and budget for long-term or phased-in development and improvements. Why are we doing this now for JC Park? In 2003, the city formed a public-private agreement for the operation of Quarry Beach. So if you've been there, since 2003, during the summer, 2013, during the summertime, you will see a bunch of blow up things in the water, and those are called wibbits. And we work with, now, for the last three years, Mike Miller, who's the owner of EOS, to operate the Quarry Beach. This has been a very successful relationship. And we've seen that from this relationship, we need to further look into the future of not only the Quarry Beach and what's happening there and what it can become and possible new relationships, public-private, but also at the disc golf course, also at our mountain biking trails, hiking trails, at the river corridor, at extending 
any trails that we may have uh, to and from the park. We have two major parks adjacent to JC Park, Maywood and Evergreen. So we're taking a look at how those all connect, how they can complement each other, the connectivity through paths. And again, we're very excited to move forward with this process and we'd love to hear your comments. So I'm going to turn this over to Joel Porter and uh, let him do the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And uh, thanks for everyone attending, both in person and virtually. Uh, <laughs> these are uh, trying times for everyone, so I appreciate uh, everyone's patience as we uh, navigate this uh, more virtual uh, setting. But um, <clears throat> I'm the uh, project manager for uh, GRAFE on this project, and um, I'll be walking you through uh, the, the design process uh, what we've done to date and um, where we want to be toward the end of the year. And uh, as Joe uh, Curlin had mentioned, uh, this is a master planning process. So uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, big ideas that influence the future of the park moving forward into the future. Uh, with that, you know, one of the very first things that uh, we did was <clears throat> Uh, basically uh, inventory the park and identify opportunities and constraints both um, regionally and more locally. <clears throat> what you can see here is uh, uh, what we call a context map which shows uh, relationships between Quarry Park and other public destinations uh, as well as uh, public transit routes and um, regional, regional proximity to Lake Michigan. Quarry Park, uh, <clears throat> the northern boundary of Quarry Park is right along the Pigeon River, which flows directly into uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, the <clears throat> orange circles represent uh, a 20 minute walk from Quarry Park or to Quarry Park and a five minute bike ride. So it gives you an idea of <clears throat> how uh, close Quarry Park is to some of these other uh, public destinations. <clears throat> During our physical site inventory, uh, we, we identified uh, you know, basically existing conditions that in, informed our analysis moving forward uh, and, in, in identifying opportunities and uh, challenges associated with uh, the current site. Um, I'm going to see if I can figure out how to use this pointer here. So uh, the, the first uh, photo on the top left uh, shows an example of, uh, you know, some challenging access uh, into not only the park but the beach itself. Uh, two, there's uh, the, the pedestrian routes um, both uh, are limited in uh, size and uh, hierarchy in terms of how they can be used. Uh, a big one is restricted views of the water, which you can see in image three here. You know, you don't, when you uh, go in, uh, when you enter the park, uh, you know, you, you can't see immediately the uh, park's number one asset, which is the pond. So that was something that we identified right away as not only a, a, a challenge, but also an opportunity that we'll discuss uh, later. Uh, there is um, you know, restricted access to the beach, which uh, both from a physical standpoint and logistic standpoint. There's some remnant structures from uh, an old water slide for anyone who is familiar with the park years ago. There's a significant erosion along the Pigeon River. As you can see here, there's a trail running right along the edge that is about to fall right into the river. Um, there's currently approximately 150 parking spaces. And, um, you know, there's the stormwater runoff from the parking lot that flows directly into the Pigeon River. There are great views uh, around the pond. Uh, from these bluffs that average in height uh, in relation to the, to the water level uh, between 3 and 9 to 12 feet. 
there's a 20 hole disc golf course, which is very popular. There's a swimming beach that, uh, as probably many of you know, is also very popular. You do, uh, it is paid access, but the rest of the park is uh, open. And there's some public, par uh, public art uh, along the perimeter of, of the park here near the underpass that connects um, Quarry Park to uh, Evergreen Park. <clears throat> so with the inventory, we generated a, a site analysis that identified opportunities and constraints. Uh, basically, um, what that means is uh, these, these opportunities and constraints uh, inform the design moving forward. So <clears throat> one thing that we identified as an opportunity is uh, kind of a, an increased uh, presence along Calumet Drive here uh, and in, uh, an enhanced entry experience into the park. <clears throat> Another opportunity is to open views up into the pond, and that is also part of that entry experience. <clears throat> There's uh, limited access uh, to uh, the beach and uh, wayfinding as far as access to the trails that run throughout the park. Um, There's you know, the, the bluffs that occur, this being a, the, a, a remnant quarry, There's uh, basically a vertical drop around, you know, three quarters of, of, the, uh, of the pond here. And that presents both an opportunity and a constraint from uh, physical access. So it's, um, you know, the, on the north side of the pond, there's about uh, an average of a three foot drop. And on the northeast corner uh, and along the east side, that bluff and the vertical drop increases to about uh, nine to, to 12 feet. <clears throat> Uh, the existing infrastructure, the playground, is outdated, so there's an opportunity to improve that. There's a significant topographic change along the east side uh, leading down, so there's uh, access challenges associated with that. There's some low-lying areas, uh, kind of in the northeastern portion of the park, that uh, are both an opportunity and a constraint. Uh, it's a great uh, naturalized area. Um, for uh, wildlife viewing and interpretive uh, uh, experiences, but um, it's also uh, very wet back there. So from a, a use standpoint, there's some limitations there. And uh, this just summarizes those opportunities and constraints. And I'm not gonna uh, delve into this um, much right now, but there will be a PDF of this presentation available on uh, the DPW website uh, if you wanna take a closer look at these. And uh, again, as Joe was saying, there's also a link to uh, provide uh, questions and comments based upon um, the presentation that you see today or in the future. So <clears throat> what we've heard thus far, based upon uh, a couple of meetings we've had uh, with both the uh, the steering committee that uh, uh, Joe Curlin manages, as well as the stakeholder groups, uh, which represent uh, you know, the majority of the users of the park, um, led us uh, to develop two high-level uh, concept alternatives that identify program elements uh, that will um, eventually be refined into a, a, consensus, a single consensus plan that shows a little bit more detail. But um, tonight we're here to talk a little bit about those two design alternatives and to get your feedback and your input on um, likes, dislikes, and, and questions that you may have associated with those uh, concept alternatives. So just to help you familiarize yourself with the site. Um, you can see here that the Pigeon River, you can barely see, forms kind of the northern boundary of the park. <clears throat> the pond is more centrally located. Parking is right off Calumet Drive. Uh, the, the Pigeon River Elementary School is on the, the east side of the park. And uh, the, uh, the 20 hole disc golf course 
is on the eastern portion of the park and um, kind of meanders its way down the slope and into the, the more heavily forested area and low-lying areas of the park. With that, I'm going to hand uh, the presentation over to Alex, who is going to talk uh, a little bit more uh, in detail about each of the concept alternatives that we've developed today. Thank you, Joe. Um, so as we mentioned earlier in this presentation, um, this is a high-level master planning process. Um, so a lot of what you're seeing on the screen right now um, is really just trying to get the program right. How are we going to fit the bones inside this park um, as it continues to develop into the future? Um, and, that, and as Joe just alluded to, um, we'd like to get your feedback on what some of these might look like. Um, so at this level, we don't quite know if something's wood or metal, um, if it's yellow or green. Um, but we're trying to get an idea of what you would like to see in the park, um, as well as um, how you envision it going forward through this process or through the rest of this process. Um, so a couple of the high level um, program elements that we want to highlight tonight um, are the idea of creating a new mixed use park building or, and or renovating the existing with another uh, type of structure. Uh, accessory structure that would enhance future use, uh, year-round use of the park uh, for, the, for many decades to come. Um, so in the first concept that you're looking at, uh, concept alternative one, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, so we'll focus in this area first. Um, so the idea behind this concept is to uh, create a new multi-use park building near the current location um, so the idea behind this is to emphasize the infrastructure that's already there, um, but it's also to uh, create this um, new opportunity for the existing beach as well as future expansion along the southeastern, uh, southwestern corner of the pond. Um, so this would, you know, be in the shape of or the form of um, a new perch beach or some other outdoor activity center that uh, would allow public access to the southern uh, portion of the park. Um, one way to accomplish this uh, is we're looking at the idea of reducing some of the parking. Um, it was mentioned that there is currently 150 spots on, uh, in, in the park and that may be a little bit much for the current activities uh, in, with, that are being held here. Um, so the idea is that um, this concept shrinks the parking a bit, um, so that way we can increase more green space along Calumet Drive, but it also allows us to pull the edge of where the existing parking, which currently is closer to the water's edge, and it allows us to create this pedestrian zone or basically reclaiming the park space back to uh, the park instead of vehicles. Um, and that kind of goes throughout this whole area that you're seeing in dark green here. Um, another thing that uh, we want to accomplish in both of these concepts um, is to open up views to the, to the water and to the park. Um, so this can be accomplished with selective tree uh, removal along the shoreline, um, as well as uh, programming or locating some of these program elements in ways that provide uh, these view shots. Um, for example, uh, if a new picnic shelter were to be uh, constructed in the southeast corner here, um, we might want to look at how we could open these views out over the bluff, um, out over the pond, um, and into the other areas of the park, as well as um, an enhanced playground or a, a new relocated playground. Um, how could that interact with the bluff as well as the views within the current park? Um, concept one here also. So while I mentioned that we're showing a reduction in uh, parking to the western side of the park, um, we'd look at expanding um, some parking over here. So that would offer uh, benefits to the disc, user, the disc golf users, um, the picnic shelter, uh, potential new playground, um, as well as the multitude of hiking trails and, and biking access within this area, uh, within this park. Um, another concept or high level uh, program idea that you're gonna see in both alternatives is what you're seeing in orange here um, and we're envisioning that as a paved loop trail that would encompass the pond um, for year-round activity. 
Uh, that could be used in the winter for walking your dog. Um, it could be used as a uh, running loop in, the, uh, in any other time of year as well. Um, but it also emphasizes the connection to Evergreen Park down here. So you could really use this as a turning point um, as you're using the entire trail system within these two great resources. Um, the final uh, element that I want to point out on the southeastern corner um, is we're looking at how could some of this open space that is currently being used um, as a disc golf course uh, kind of be used as a flex space. So it would accompany the disc golf users um, as well as this tra paved trail and uh, other trail users. Um, but could we incorporate something that's more of this event lawn that would maybe be able to accompany um, events in the park or it, it becomes a gathering place for birthday parties um, or, or other elements like that within, within the park. Al Alex, could yes. I just add one thing? Yes. Uh, I just want to make sure there's a clarification here. It is in print and it says reduce parking. What we're really talking about is relocating parking. So we're not reducing the parking. We're relocating with a better distribution in, in, in a different precinct. Thank you, Ed. Um, and then, so going back, the, the last point that we want to talk about, or there's two last points that I want to talk about um, in terms of the overall program intent uh, for both these alternatives. Um, the, the, the big one is looking at some type of an accessory structure across uh, from the beach. Uh, Joe mentioned that as the area where there used to be a water slide. Um, it's got some remnant infrastructure currently associated with it. Um, the idea of having some type of terrace patio, beer garden, um, concession stand is not only attractant to the park, um, but it's a nice little amenity for uh, uh, company parties or evening events, um, something that is uh, relaxed and really in taking advantage of this great resource, the pond. Um, as we pointed out, there's some pretty spectacular views. Um, and then the last point I want to talk to is we looked at the idea of how could we incorporate some uh, new native landscaping or enhanced landscape that starts to really define some of these areas. So this could be used to define some of the disc golf holes. Um, it could be used as educational purposes, uh, pollinator habitat, um, at, as you use the loop trail. And, and like I said, it, it encompasses some of the disc golf holes, so it starts to help delineate those a little better. Um, as more of a feature within themselves. Uh, so concept alternative number two um, has a lot of the overarching theme uh, that I just went over. Um, but some of the, the big changes here in the program um, is that we're looking at renovating the existing beach structure or beach building. Um, so whether that becomes something that is an accessory park building, um, it, it enhances the, the beach program that is currently being operated. Um, but it, it would be more of a renovation. And then we would look at creating a new multi-use park building on the southeastern side. Um, the benefits to this is it helps to delineate the two program uses between the swimming beach and potential other users of the park. Um, it takes advantage of these great views that are going out over the pond. Um, the location that we're currently showing sits about 14 feet above the 10 foot, 12 foot drop that Joe mentioned before. So you're approximately 28 feet, 26 feet overlooking uh, the water. Um, and that's quite a spectacular view. Um, in this scheme, as Ed mentioned, um, we're relocating some of the parking, um, but we're also trying to reconfigure it in, in, in different forms. Um, this way we can incorporate green space into the parking um, and, and green infrastructure, something that helps to alleviate some of the runoff issues that are see currently seen um, into the Pigeon River. Um, but uh, it, the idea behind relocating uh, some of this parking is it's, it gives us this opportunity to create this, um, what we're calling a destination in the park. Um, some type of, it could be some type of lodge structure. We, obviously there are no details um, behind some of that stuff right now, but um, we're envisioning weddings, work Christmas parties. Um, it really activates this side of the park and, and it creates another reason to be 
uh, active, you know, enjoying the park um, besides the swimming beach and, and the disc golf and, and some of the other program activities. Um, so similar to the other plan, um, the other concept, we have a, a similar paved loop trail. Um, it has a little bit different configuration based on how this ultimately uh, gets resolved. Um, the difference with putting the, the program or the new multi-use park building in this location is it does affect a few of the disc golf holes. Um, so previously on the last uh, concept plan, um, there was no need to relocate any of the holes. Um, in this plan, we, have, we look at how can we incorporate hole 20 and hole 1 to better suit this program use. Um, we, we wouldn't lose anything, uh, any disc holes in, this, in either of these options. Um, it does, though, uh, have a better flow program-wise to incorporate all of these elements together. Um, on the northeastern side, um, similar to the previous option, we are looking at some type of uh, structure whether this becomes a tiki bar in this option with some overlook structures uh, for you to enjoy a drink or a work party or even um, just to relax as your kids are playing in the water. It provides these great views of the beach um, and access to the beach as well. So it really is this nice alternative to, um, uh, if you don't want to be out in the water playing, you can still enjoy everything that's offered at this program. Um, to the north here, we, instead of native or, you know, enhanced vegetation, we're looking at something that might be focused on like a recreational lawn. Um, this could be a picnic area, a place to gather, um, just kind of relax as you're overlooking. It's a slightly sloped hill down to the quarry pond, um, which makes it a great place to overlook. You can see the tall bluffs on this end, again, taking advantage of some of those extraordinary views. Um, and then this option, so finally this option, um, we look at creating these overlook opportunities um, around the pond. So again, taking advantage of those views, but in this scheme, using something with a little bit more structure uh, than what uh, the previous option looked like. Um, I should mention that in either of these options, um, tonight we're looking for comments and feedback. So if you see something that, that wasn't in the first option, I mean, we can incorporate overlooks into into both options. Um, we're just trying to differentiate uh, both of the plans. That's a good point, Alex. Um, I, I, you know, moving forward uh, with a single consensus plan, I, I just want to make sure it's clear that, you know, the intention is not to select one uh, of these alternatives over the other. Uh, it's very likely that we will combine the best um, ideas from both options into a, a single, you know, final consensus plan. So um, please don't think that you have to choose one of these alternatives over the other, uh, more so um, individual program elements uh, within each alternative. Correct, we're looking for the pieces that make the, the option. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just like to add in too that as we have observed, studied, and listened, um, one of the things that, one of the objectives of this master plan was not to duplicate or compete with the environmental programs that are offered in Maywood or some of the programs offered in Evergreen. So we're trying to complement those uses. So for example, uh, cross-country skiing may be more appropriate in Evergreen because of current <coughs> investments and patterns and snowshoeing might be more appropriate in the trails of Quarry Park. So, so we're, again, we're trying to uh, reduce redundancy or conflict and competition and complement and build on the other programs and have some unique programs that are more fitting to Quarry. Thanks, Ed. And uh, speaking of conflict, one thing uh, that we should probably point out um, is that these uh, new uh, proposed program elements uh, closer to the uh, the southeast corner of the, the park adjacent to the disc golf course. We understand that, um, you know, the sensitive nature uh, between um, those two somewhat um, uh, disparate uses and uh, we would, of course, uh, uh, create some physical separation between um, incompatible or, or less uh, than compatible uses through vegetative screening, et cetera. So 
that is definitely something we are considering moving forward. Um, so the next couple slides um, detail out some of the design precedent uh, images that we've used um, in the past and for this project um, to kind of start to illustrate what we're envisioning some of this stuff might be. Um, again, it's not to say this is what we're picking, you know, in terms of that's the actual design, but we're trying to get the idea of, you know, an overhang uh, cantilevered roof with a lot of glass, uh, two-story, um, outdoor dining. Um, so I kind of want to run through a little bit of these um, just to kind of highlight some of the ideas of what this could look like um, as we move forward when we start to flush out what some of these details uh, look like. Once we get the bones in the right place, now we start to add uh, the meat to it. Um, so on the screen you're seeing, um, we have a couple options um, that we're looking at, again, for multi-use park structures and park buildings. Um, outdoor dining type solution, so uh, there's a more formal type solution um, versus more of a casual, um, potentially cafe. It could be a just walk up and picnic kind of overlook um, area. Um, uh, another form of concession stands, uh, you know, a little bit more open, airy. It can be used as an informal meeting spot. It can be used as a formal get, uh, formal gathering as well. Um, we looked at, you know, some more traditional park structures, um, some more modern shade structures and park structures. Um, it, it depends on uh, the preference of the community and, and how this moves forward and which direction we go. But you can see there's benefits to both. This has the the classic um, woodsy park feel, um, where this has the, the modern um, open space, uh, gathering type uh, community feeling. Um, uh, we looked at, um, again, more concession stands, um, whether that's you know, simply run through the park building um, or becomes more of this uh, public plaza type space where maybe there's a beer garden or a place for food trucks to pull up something that becomes more of a destination versus a uh, uh, passive type concession stand uh, within the park. Now, I, just to add to that, um, I, you know, the, an, another consideration when it comes to master planning, especially with, uh, you know, public parks and, and, and regional destinations is revenue generation. So we're considering how uh, revenue generation gets folded into the design and, and two ways of doing that um, are through concessions or, or maybe even a beer garden. Uh, the city of Milwaukee uh, Parks uh, has uh, uh, done a great job with uh, a rotating beer garden uh, that I've experienced firsthand. Uh, it's uh, quite successful and um, both uh, from a kind of uh, uh, social interaction standpoint as well as a revenue uh, generation standpoint. If I'm not mistaken, Ed, I believe those pulling close to 100,000 a year, correct? Yeah, uh, it's again, uh, it's, very uh, successful. Uh, those parks are actually under the uh, ownership of Milwaukee County, and uh, they have four permanent and one mobile. And from Memorial Day to the end of October, they generate between 80 and 100,000 per season. So that's quite a bit of revenue. Uh, some other things that we're looking at, um, I mentioned uh, green infrastructure uh, to kind of alleviate some of the runoff um, solutions, so whether that's uh, bioswales or, or permeable pavers. Um, but then we also want to make an emphasis of the trails, uh, and I alluded to that with the, looped or the paved loop trail, um, as well as some of the, the more rugged hiking and mountain biking trails. So, you know, maybe creating these distance uh, markers, um, using J.C. Quarry Park as a, a trailhead, um, you know, the endless, the possibilities are endless um, on how we can incorporate some, um, some trail access and, and signage. Um, as also mentioned before about maybe it becomes the snowshoeing capital of Sheboygan. Um, and uh, currently there's already disc golf, which is very successful um, and, and most likely is going to stay that way. Um, but then, uh, you know, looking at how these, ed additionally looking at edge treatments around the water. So are there potentially piers? Um, what are these, some of these overlooks might look like? Um, I, you know, overlooks going back to these structures, maybe they become something like this, or they have a little bit different design language um, that are, is a little bit uh, apparent to, to their location in the site. 
A few other elements um, that we looked at were how can we create a better playground? Um, currently it's outdated. Um, a really popular thing right now is uh, the nature playgrounds. Um, they, you, you can see this one actually is overlooking a body of water, um, but it's really just rocks, uh, hills, stumps, um, and kids will play on this for hours. Um, so, you know, something like this maybe would fit that uh, scenario or the location um, within the park, um, as well as, you know, maybe more exercise equipment or more traditional multi-age playgrounds, something that uh, kids of all ages can use, um, your typical swing slides, uh, and, and different things like that. Uh, a few other things that we looked at um, were park games, um, you know, areas, uh, and this can be really focused in the recreational lawn that I had mentioned. Um, you can play, you know, cornhole, um, bocce, uh, croquet if that's still a thing. Um, uh, incorporating grilling areas as part of these overlooks. Um, maybe this idea of interactive water play. Um, uh, that isn't necessarily tied to the quarry, but it's in relationship to the natural elements that exist within the park. Um, I mentioned food trucks before. Uh, you know, this would provide an opportunity for live music at some of these new uh, park structures. You know, something very simple like this, um, where it's activated during the day, it's activated at night. Uh, there doesn't have to be necessarily a formal operation to it, but it's inviting for people of all ages to enjoy the park. Um, and, and the last few images, um, so what some of these, you know, enhanced mountain biking, um, fire pits that overlook the water, um, Madison has done, uh, Picnic Point has a few rentable fire pits similar to this. This is actually at the terminus of that. Um, and people can rent those and go out and have a, a work party or a family gathering if they don't have the luxury of a fire pit at home. And you don't even have to go camping. To, to participate, this could happen on a, on a Tuesday night. Um, and then the last few things were these plaza lawns or, or, or perch beach that I mentioned before. Something that doesn't have access to the water but allows um, sunbathing, playing in the sand, it gives the beach experience um, without actually having to go into the water. Um, and then the last one is, uh, you know, flexible open space. I think uh, we all know what that feels like, um, but the idea of how this can be used for a concert or a wedding or movies in the park or uh, art fair. Um, I mean, there's, the possibilities are endless for, for a space like this. Um, so I think. Yeah, so, that. so we've thrown a lot of stuff at you and you know, we've had the benefit of talking to a lot of people. Obviously, we haven't had the uh, opportunity to speak with all of you one-on-one, -on -one, but hopefully tonight, <clears throat> will reduce that gap. So we've, we've had the uh, benefit of assimilating a lot of things <clears throat> over the last couple of months. So you've been given a big dose of the, 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 the distillation and the summary through our filters, our ears, our eyes. So is there anything for those of you that are here tonight, <clears throat> is there anything that we could clarify? And again, we, we apologize. We sometimes default to professional language and cliches and nomenclature. So I want to make sure that we're, we're being polite and communicating as, as, as the best we can. <clears throat> For those of you that aren't here tonight, <clears throat> again, Joe at, and Public Works is uh, eagerly waiting your questions, comments, <clears throat> and uh, the important thing of tonight is not so much do you like this or do you like that, is have we missed anything? You know, what, what, what would you like to see happen in Sheboygan and, and increase the versatility, diversity of what uh, your park system has to offer? I, I, uh, I don't know, can, can you guys hear me? This is John from the rec department, virtual. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? <laughs> All right, I wasn't sure. I know I play real golf or regular golf. Is there a norm for disc golf that it's 20 holes and maybe I missed that discussion at the last planning meeting? Um, is it normally 18 or is it, I mean, if they miss a couple holes or is that gonna cause a problem? I guess my question is, 
what's the norm for disc golf if there is one? So, so I'm not a disc golfer. We have somebody in the audience who knows the sport. Uh, to my experience, it's typically 18. Uh, I hope I'm not wrong. <clears throat> but again, that's my experience. Uh, that doesn't mean... Hello? So, so that doesn't mean some courses don't have more that you can rotate in a hole, rotate out a hole, maintenance, uh, degree of difficulty, things like that are not that different than what you might see on a regular golf course. But the official uh, league play that I'm familiar with is typically based on the number nine or multiples of the number nine. Is there anybody in the audience who plays this that can <laughs> add to that? Yeah, that is correct. It is either nine or 18 is the, is the total. So that, it's just like regular golf. Otherwise, you're just using a, a basket in a, in a Frisbee versus a, uh, a club and a, and a ball. So, but everything else is the same. Well, I, I, I appreciate it's a par three. Yeah. And a, again, like, like regular golf, there's many ways that you can uh, modify the length, uh, enhance or uh, challenge the, the par, and uh, make it more competitive or less competitive. The, the reason why there are 20 holes here is because there was space for 20 holes. But I think what that offers is an opportunity uh, and some degree of flexibility <clears throat> in, uh, you know, if we did... You know, if we collectively wanted to allocate some of that space that's currently being used for disc golf for some other use, I see it as an opportunity because we have what many perceive as two additional holes there. Let, let, let me just put a, one other um, layer or offer you uh, another way of looking at this. So the master plan at a very high level is identifying one of the desirable and popular uses is the disc golf. What we're looking at today, we are not in any way, shape, or form eliminating disc golf in the park. It's staying. The majority of the area that you know of as the, the, the uh, course today is staying intact. So the, as, as the popularity or the management and, and the usage of the, the course changes, is challenged, whatever, uh, we're pretty much honoring more or less the, the, the uh, current property of the golf, except in one option to create a little more separation, as Joe was uh, alluding to earlier, and making the fit more compatible. We are suggesting that it would uh, probably affect the relocation of two holes. Whether you want to have 20, 18, 21, that's really up to the management of the course within that bubble. We're certainly not implying or recommending that it goes to 17. <laughs> Just to follow up on that, I mean, I'm thoroughly impressed. I mean, this is like a comparable to the destination Kohler golf courses and with the addition of the golf and all of these things. I mean, there's some really beautiful amenities and potential. It's just great. You guys are talking about it and I'll sign out now, but it's, I'm thoroughly impressed with all the, the ideas and the drawings and the thought, the process that's been put into it. So, um, you know, is there a long-term plan for funding or starting or is it, is, are we still just in the planning? Sorry that I'm. Yep. Thank you, John. And, and, and I could talk to that. Um, this, this is truly the design process. And you're right, there are some beautiful things on this. I just want to convey that to everyone, too. This is really some big thinking, uh, you know, um, as well as some smaller things that could be done right away. Um, the next step is, is relationships, um, agreements, um, public, private. Um, we'll, we'll go from there. But we really want to kind of have a, a thought process of, of where we're going to go and then start figuring out how we're going to get there. Thanks, Joe. And, and to add to that, you know, with any master plan, when we're talking about big ideas like this it, and implementing those ideas, it's almost always phased. So 
once we reach a consensus plan moving forward uh, based upon your input uh, tonight and um, in the near future, we are going to pull together um, uh, a phasing diagram that um, identifies priorities and phased implementation based upon budget so that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're creating an opportunity to uh, implement um, uh, different elements of the design in, in bite-sized chunks. We, we also want you to think about a dimension we haven't discussed in the presentation, and that's time. <clears throat> so the seasonality of this property, and we, we just had some questions and clarifications on the disc, but we talked about the beach. So this is a 12-month facility, and so you know, we did allude to or talk about snowshoeing or, or skiing. Uh, but just the the twelve month opportunity of hiking, uh, bird watching, the balance of natural versus uh, program recreation, uh, the the wood the woodland area and its its magic, you know the ability to introduce uh, boardwalks and and modify that experience, the interface with the river, those are all important things. <clears throat> so it's not just the obvious things that we want to talk about or get feedback on in terms of the buildings, the, the, the shoreline, uh, the adjacencies and the shared uh, facilities. So the relocation of the parking, is that the right thing to do? This circular paved uh, primary or alpha trail system that Alex mentioned, you know, does that serve the, for a better universal access, uh, a greater diversity and multi-generational use? So those are all things that have been in the back of our head and we want you to also weigh in on. That's right, and, and, and one of the reasons for that paved loop trail is not only to create uh, another destination within the park, but it um, allows an opportunity for, um, for it to be maintained throughout all um, uh, 12 months of the year so that people can use it uh, throughout the winter as well as uh, spring, summer, and fall. Excuse me. Um, I was just wondering. I actually, my home actually borders um, the golf course on North 28th Street, and um, I think all of it, all of this is fantastic. I really do. I love it. My one concern would be is the entrance that you have uh, to the park area coming from Pershing Avenue onto North 28th Street over there. I can't really tell, but. My only concern is, is there are a lot of children in the area that live in that neighborhood um, and that, that there'd be an increase in traffic. So I'm just, I'm just concerned about that. Otherwise, everything else is, is really nice. Okay, a point well taken. Thank you. Any other concerns? Um, lighting, security, noise? Hours of operation. So uh, we don't it, have- My question would be, it, it just seems like there's underutilized performance spaces. So I, I wouldn't favor another, I mean, probably a smaller space, but I, you know, I, we see kind of the fountain park has a, a nice space that isn't, it's used, but it's not as much as I think it could be, but that's my personal opinion. So I, I, I was surprised to see like an outdoor Kind of performance space in the in the mix. Sure, and and um, since I have you on the phone, uh, would that be more desirable closer to parking? Or, for example, there's that large uh, recreational lawn just uh, northeast of of the uh, the old water slides. Would people walk to an area that's not exactly adjacent to parking for music? Uh, a movie night, things like that? Or does it have to be fairly close to uh, Calumet? Think about it. <laughs> we don't need an answer tonight. Um, you had mentioned uh, lighting, um, noise, all those things, times that would be operating all that stuff. I, I guess I would like to hear what you guys would say about that as well. <laughs> Well, well, typically, I think it's becoming more and more of a uh, understood desire that we be respectful of night lighting and the impacts on night skies. So I think 
that's kind of the philosophy and the design and planning direction that we would certainly recommend and encourage. Uh, technolo technology today, it's amazing what's out there in terms of being able to control light sources. It, it requires picking the right fixture, putting it obviously in the best place. Uh, they are also very efficient, so they use less energy. And what's really impressive is they go from 10,000 to 70,000 hours of usage. So uh, maintenance and repair and cost are reduced tremendously. So I think the lighting would probably uh, also be used as a, uh, from a prioritization where it would make sure that, uh, for example, the entrance to the park where there are major pedestrian automobile interfaces that we optimize their use to minimize uh, conflict and, and safety. Uh, you can also, again, I think as you talk with the, the parks department, uh, there's something wonderful about you know, walking with a flashlight in the family, candlelight walks, full moon walks. So there's a lot of programmatic things that do not ask for lighting. So I think the programming and the management of the use is probably the easiest thing. As far as we've discussed to date, most of the lighting would be around the parking lot, the entrance to the building, service, things like that. So where you need it for safety and, and the, the moving of vehicles and services, that's probably the primary area. The other thing you can do too is even uh, with you know, the technology, smartphones, whatever, if there, are light, if there is a zoning plan for the lighting, those can also be managed to a, a very uh, rigorous plan where you can actually schedule and, and interface with, uh, with technology to turn them on and off. So for example, if there was a performance area in the lawn, I'm looking at uh, concept two, there's that oblong green area on the north side of, of the pond. Let's say you have an event that, that ends, you know, at 10.30, it's the end of movie night. So you could have all those trail lights slowly come up, people egress, it's safe egress, and then they slowly turn down and it's, it's back to the night. So you can manage it to, uh, to whatever program you want. Of course, it, everything has a price. But I think that's, that's the uh, fine-tuned use of lighting that we, we wish for you. Uh, hey, group, can you hear me? This is uh, Rebecca Clark tuning in. Um, the plan plans and options look fabulous. This is such a great part for folks in the county. Um, and I'm, I'm personally, I, I hope some of this can be implemented. In terms of security, I think it's been proven that the more a park is used by residents, um, the less vandalism and, and things you have to worry about. So by creating more usable spaces or access, I think this is really great. I'm kind of curious about that entrance along Calumet Drive. So we've talked about it's a pretty deep parking lot, and then the building is tucked back there. And on this kind of major thoroughfare going in and out of town, is people either maybe driving up to Highway 43 or, or coming into town, is there any way we can make that long kind of entrance of the quarry more visually attractive so people know, hey, what's in there? You know, what's, what's happening versus just a big cement thing? Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we, we sympathize with your concern there and, um, have you know I definitely identified that as uh, a current constraint, but also an opportunity to do something uh, uh, much uh, much nicer uh, in terms of an entry experience um, by not only um, reducing visibility of the parking, but increasing visibility of the pond, so that there's uh, you know there's there's a sense of uh, identity uh, from Calumet Drive, so that it's uh, it's just a lot more visible. Yeah, you 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 bring up a lot of good points, and by the way, we're in full agreement with your <laughs> your observation in terms of uh, eyes in the park are a lot cheaper on the tax roll than hiring additional officers. 
That's um, right. But but to reinforce Joe's point is that this is where we do then delve into the uh, the design side of the equation, and uh, you use design to help achieve a lot of what you're you're uh, observing. And even Evergreen Park has much more of a traditional civic park gateway entrance. Uh, it's kind of nice that we can we have the opportunity to differentiate that that entry experience, but there's absolutely no reason this can't be uh, more attractive. And if uh, if you look closely at the plans, and I realize it's it's hard to interpret what's in our head and on this drawing, but there is more green suggested around that. And um, the other thing that uh, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, I was probably uh, distracted as the presentation was occurring because I know this fairly well, but we're also enhancing the crossing underneath uh, Calumet. So the connection between Quarry and Evergreen one of the major recommendations is to make that more friendly, but more importantly, make it uh, more negotiable in terms of um, grades so that people, that pedestrians and bicyclists and families use that more than trying to go out to Calumet and then cross. So there's, there's a number of other uh, entries into the park that we also wanna make sure uh, be, receive some enhancement. With it. That's great. This is Rebecca. Again, just one more question. I'm sure it's in here somewhere. And Joe Curlin, you probably knew I was going to ask this, but I'm hoping that there's a lot of either renewable energy, uh, recycled materials, solar panels, throw in a couple of charging stations. <laughs> I hope some of those ideas are out there. Uh, yes, and, and I think both Alex and, and uh, Joe Porter on, on our team, as well as uh, Joe from the city's goals. Uh, so a lot of the uh, the drainage, the, the discussions on the parking lots are reducing heat reflection, increasing uh, wa stormwater management. We actually separate, part of the reason for uh, reducing some of the paving at the existing pavilion is to create more areas to treat the water before it goes into the river. So material selections, the uh, building materials, all those things will be in, a, in a, uh, a recommendation list in terms of as these enhancements go forward. And I think I mentioned earlier, even the selection of the lighting, you know, LEDs, uh, energy efficient, maintenance efficient. So those, we'll make sure all that gets outlined in our summary. Yeah, there's, there's no reason to uh, not recommend dark sky compliant lighting and, and other uh, sustainable infrastructure. Yeah. So, so we're, we're, we're trying to be on the same page. Any other questions or comments? Well, all of your questions have been point on, and uh, it's as if you've been working on this with us for two months. Is there anybody else out there who's a little more shy who uh, is just dying to ask us or contribute? So again, I just want to remind everybody, uh, those that are here, there are slips of paper that you can comment in person tonight uh, in writing. Again, I understand that this is the first time for a number of people. So whether you're talking to your neighbor or in the shower and you come up with another idea, please contact Joe at, at the city. And uh, it doesn't stop here tonight. The intent is for it to grow. We have uh, another uh, public opportunity. I think it's around Thanksgiving or just before Thanksgiving. That's right. So uh, next steps will be, uh, you know, to collect as much uh, input from you as possible within the near future. Um, there are uh, links, uh, multiple links um, on DPW's website uh, that provide an opportunity for you to uh, send uh, DPW questions and or comments and to take a closer look at the presentation, um, tonight's presentation. And um, we will then um, uh, meet back with the city to discuss uh, what we heard about uh, the two concept alternatives and uh, how to uh, move forward with a consensus plan and that plan, that, that single consensus plan uh, will then um, be presented 
uh, uh, to the uh, Marina Parks and Forestry in uh, sometime in early November. Uh, we'll certainly let you know the exact date when we nail that down, but it is uh, slated for uh, um, the first week of November currently. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I just want to say one more time again, this is a, a very exciting process that we do not get to do often. And um, the JC Park is, if anybody that's ever been there, is it's just a beautiful area to walk around. It's a highly underused. Um, I, I, I think that um, this is just something that could really, we could, put on paper and start working towards, um, you know, implementing the design. And we, we've done it before. Uh, the city of Sheboygan is, has been great at uh, building um, places, um, destinations, King Park Pavilion, uh, the, the Land Community Center, the Skate Park, just to name a few recently. And um, I think we can do it here, the Shaw Family Playground, um, you know, and, and that was a majority of that was, was um, privately fundraised for uh, with the assistance of the city too. So um, you, you, you look at these two designs and, and I just can't stop from being excited about what could be, what could happen and, um, and, and add to that park. So again, um, Department of Public, uh, Sheboygan, DPW, um, you Google it, it'll bring you right there. Go to contacts, easily fill out the, the form and put in your suggestions. Talk to other people, get them excited about uh, what, what they think, what they'd like to see. Uh, call me directly, 920-459-3459. I'm in the de uh, Department of Public Works. Um, um, so just call there and you can, you can get a hold of me too. Give me your input. So we're looking for everyone's input. Um, this is truly a community build, so uh, please contact us. I'd I like to thank the Grafe team here tonight. They've done a great job uh, with these designs and, and Im implementing so far, making come to life what we've been bringing to them. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending. We look forward to uh, uh, receiving more input from you uh, within the next couple of weeks. Thank you and good night.